I, I think this is going to be an interesting panel because uh, all three of our panelists are in some way involved in the attempt to kind of bring AI to the edge as one potential uh, solution um, for the hardware dilemma that, that AI poses. Um, I'm actually going to start with, with ST. Um, I'm curious what strategies you guys have in place at Qualcomm around this um, and, and how important it is for you to sort of integrate AI at the edge into to the solutions that, har that Qualcomm is working on. Well, so thank you for the good questions, and it's really nice to be here. Um, we believe that to harness the full potential of AI, and AI has been adopted in all industries, in almost all walks of life, increasingly so, um, it needs to be intelligence everywhere. Um, by having intelligence everywhere, it, we use the terminology of hybrid AI. So you will share the AI workloads, whether at the edge or at the cloud. And as such, um, the full potential of AI can be gathered. And also, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of good benefits that come from it. Because for instance, AI that being performed at the edge can ensure a lot of personal security and confidentialities, not to mention uh, you know, it free up the traffic going up the cloud all the time. And on top of that, there's a huge economy to this as well, because edge devices, edge devices are many, many things, cell phones, smart cars, PCs these days, and thousands and millions of IoT devices. And it helps to make sure that that distributed way of uh, processing AI will also tailor for the specific AI where it is needed. So, so we are, we are, we are we're committed to that, and that's why one of the things we have done recently is we actually launched our uh, Snapdragon X Elite chipset platform for the PC. We believe 2024 is when the PC industry, the PC is being reborn. A PC is a pivotal portion of the entire um, edge AI. And not to mention, of course, smartphones and XR, VR, and so on and so forth. So we believe this is the right thing and the important thing to go. And there is a big need for a lot of the consumers, enterprises, small, medium-sized uh, companies as well, to upgrade a lot of the devices to be able to do these uh, AIs at the edge. So I think business opportunity is there. It also helped to, you know, um, involve more people into the uh, digitized economy of the future. So that's what we're well suited, you know, Qualcomm is well suited to do that. Excellent. Um, Dahi, can you tell us a little bit about Model Best and, and about Mini CPM, which is this model you developed, and how this kind of represents a step in the direction of these kinds of models that can actually run on, on edge devices? Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to be here to representing uh, Model Best. It is a premier AI startup in Beijing. Model Best is all about creating uh, uh, the top level big models. And uh, we really value efficiency. Uh, we believe that efficient model means better performance, uh, smaller uh, size, and uh, lost less costs, but with the same capabilities. Yeah. Um, and uh, even some folks in the media call us Chinese mistral because we uh, uh, because the ultimate pursuit uh, with high efficiency is the thing we have in only in common. Um, uh, instead of just uh, just comparing uh, the parameters and the performance, we focus on the knowledge density of the big model. Uh, uh, that's uh, first thing we we very very uh, uh, very focus on. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. The star product, uh, our star product is Mini CPM. It is a bunch of uh, uh, super light uh, models that you can run on your phone. Uh, and, but they pack a punch with bigger ones, such as GPT 3.5, GPT 4V, or even soon future, maybe GPT 4. Um, um, these models have been popular all over the world uh, in the past half years. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you said uh, we were speaking before, and Dahi was saying you've you've released five different versions, updated versions yeah, of yeah, mini yeah. CPM just in the last six months. Is that yes, yes? We yeah, just uh, we have already, we we move very fast. Uh, we have uh, released four, uh, uh, five versions of mini CPM in the past half years, and uh, we will uh, release uh, two version uh, additionally. Uh, in few uh, in recent months. Oh wow! Yeah. So it's, this is uh, obviously technology moving very fast, and I think yeah, what you can do on devices rapidly catching up with uh, workloads that before you could only run in a in a data center. Uh, Vinay, I want to turn to you and, and HP. Um, you're known for for PCs. You're known for printers. Where do you see AI, uh, you know, kind of fitting in with the, with that kind of hardware? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, great to be here, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, if you look at the AI story so far, Jeremy, I mean, it has mostly been data center and cloud centric, yes. right? Now we do know that while it's a very powerful story, it, is, it has limitations in terms of how much it can reach. Um, what we see is the proliferation of AI in a massive way over the next three, four years. Every person in this room and everywhere in the, um, in the world who's using a personal computer right now will find that in order to use AI, over the next three, four years, as many of the use cases emerge and perfect themselves, your current PC generation, they will be all obsolete. And for us to really take advantage of AI to um, every individual, every small and medium business, every large business, governments, um, you know, this is going to be a massive effort to provide um, AI PCs. Because at the foundation of AI is the need for driving a very order of magnitude higher computation. So you know today's PCs, there is a term now we call trillions of operations per second tops, right? Today's PCs are anywhere from you know six, eight, ten, and we are now talking about forty tops, fifty-five tops, wow. even you know higher than that. So our drive is to be able to provide um, a huge portfolio of products, PCs, printers, communication equipment that will allow people to be able to use AI models um, at the edge in whatever use cases they have. Now, uh, that's interesting. Um, one of your rivals at, at Microsoft, they kind of released this early version of a, an AI PC, um, but it, uh, it had to sort of record everything you did on the PC, uh, and some people were worried about that, even though they, they were trying to sell it as more private than having to upload data to the cloud constantly. Um, there was still this concern about security. How are you thinking about this at HP? Well, I think security is going to be extremely important if you look at it. I mean, why is security important? Because as any computational power, any software, it's a tool. You can cut it both ways, right? Um, if good guys are not going to use security and AI and the latest tools for security, the bad guys are going to do right. that. So, so what we are doing is developing models that actually learn from the various attacks that continuously happen. And those models will be AI trained. So we have a, a suite of uh, security products from you know, BIOS all the way up to the OS. We call it Wolf Security. And that is really based on AI. So it's just one example about how we have to be as uh, responsible technology providers, provide technology that can keep people safe first, and then allow them to do all the, you know, enjoy the benefits of uh, the new technology that's going to come. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask for questions from the room in a minute, so please think of your questions and raise your hand, and I'll get a mic to you. Um, but first, I want to I want to ask Dahi. Um, you talked about how popular Mini CPM has been. You also had this interesting case where uh, uh, some some researchers at Stanford uh, plagiarized uh, the model or sort of built something that seemed very based on Mini CPM. Uh, can you talk a little about what happened in that case? And and I'm curious whether this is sort of a risk in general as we move to smaller open source models that uh, you know there will be this proliferation. It will be very hard to control what people do with them. Okay, <laughs> it's really interesting. Uh, uh, we released a new uh, multi-model version of Mini CPM uh, that comparable to GPT-4V on the uh, multi-model side uh, in on May 20. Uh, it's it, it's very cool, and uh, the feedback from the open source community has been a uh, welcome. But uh, then on May 29, some people on the GitHub homepage point out to us uh, that there was a Stanford project uh, has copied us, uh, and the team claimed to have built a better model with fewer parameters, which was 100, 1% of GPT-4V, which is true, 
and the little trading training cost only five hundred dollars, which is not true, and uh, uh, smaller as as small as smart as the GPT four V, which is true. Um, after comparing, uh, we found these models are almost the same. The American one uh, could even understand the Chinese ancient text, which was merely found in the public training data. So, uh, as you know, what happened next? Uh, the Stanford team apologized publicly after uh, getting caught out of uh, the plagiarism, and they deleted the program, uh, the project on the GitHub. Um, this incident, uh, we think, is not uh, does not represent uh, Stanford officially because it's just uh, in initiated by a few undergraduate students. Um, and we forgave them and uh, uh, remind everyone to give credit to where it's due in the open source community. And uh, the incidents uh, just make us uh, appreciate the open source community even more. Uh, we are thankful for the support to resolve the issue so quickly and uh, fairly. Um, and the model best has always been active in the global open source community. Um, we have created, created uh, the Open BMB community, which has been the biggest open source community uh, in China. Uh, and we continue to work on project, open source project, and uh, uh, cooperate with other communities to uh, advance model technologies. Great. Yeah. Uh, I want to get for a question from the audience in a minute, but um, I'm going to ask ST a, a slightly awkward question, which is, um, Right now, there's a lot of concern about running these large AI workloads in data centers on the energy consumption, and a number of companies have, Microsoft and Google in particular, have said you know, they've been thrown off their, their track to uh, net zero because of the data center growth um, that they've had. Uh, and so some people are looking at, at on-device as, oh, we, we can avoid all that. But then if you, if you look carefully at where some of that uh, additional carbon footprint has come from. It's not actually the energy used to run computations in the data center. It's all the you know, energy that went into the production of the chips that are in the data center. Um, and then there's also this concern about, well, where are you running these, these models? And so if we're pushing everything onto device, my question for Qualcomm is, you know, what's happening in terms of the energy intensity and carbon intensity of the manufacture of Qualcomm chips? And then also, if we're pushing everything out to consumers and the energy is being used you know, when they charge their, their PC or their phone, um, isn't there an issue there? Because a lot of those consumers might not have access to renewable energy as, as their source of, of home power or office power. Well, I think, first of all, the, I, I think that uh, we shouldn't say that everything is pushed to the edge. There is a very uh, close collaboration between the cloud and the edge. In fact, if you look at the entire ecosystem, I, I would say that uh, you know, Qualcomm has always embraced uh, new challenges and new technologies from 3G, 4G, 5Gs. And because of the connectivity foundation that 5G have brought, it has enabled us to provide the options of processing some of these AI at the edge. But you still need the cloud to do certain, you know, it's very efficient to do like massive learning, development stuff on the clouds. But then there are minute little things that make sense to do it at the edge. I think the, the, the tricks and the intelligence and the innovations is what to do where. So you, you have things that will happen on the edge, on the, my little cell phone, my PCs in my car, that are not even an option not to do it there because you need that latency. You need that short latency like a, a, a smart cars. You need to have that response immediately. Right. So there are these things that are just absolutely make sense to do it there. And then as you grow it bigger, the cell get bigger and bigger, you go do uh, the intelligence at the edge and then more edge and then to the clouds. So I think there is that intelligence that with, uh, with the liberalization of the technology and know-how and empowering so many smart people to do the right thing, there will be a good balancing point where I think the, the industry and the, uh, the developers and companies will, write the, will find the right balance to where it is. That's why I think that 
the model that will really reap the benefits of AI is something called the hybrid AI, right. which is going to be cloud edge devices and so on and so forth. In a, in a network. Yeah. Uh, questions from the audience. Does anyone have a, have a question? If not, I've got more, so don't worry. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'm actually going to turn to Vinay also and ask on the sustainability question. Um, it, I mean, you just said everybody's going to need a new PC. Uh, in the next few years, and maybe we're all going to need new phones too, because we're going to need that that latest uh, Elite X chip uh, from Qualcomm. Doesn't that create a, also a sustainability issue? You're going to have all these people discarding these old devices. You're going to have an e-waste issue. How is HP kind of looking at that? Because I know you have a you have a firm commitment to sustainability, but does this throw you off of that? It does not. Okay. I actually, we, if anything, we are accelerating our commitment to our sustainability goals, and because it, you know our sustainability uh, framework is very broad, we we look at how to make devices more efficient, which means today we are working on devices that can actually have truly 24 hours, 48 hour battery life. You make them more efficient, the, you know, because there is less loss of power when you are using those devices. That's one uh, part of the framework. The second part of the framework is using sustainable materials as we build our devices. So every PC, every printer today now has recycled material, not just plastic, but recycled, um, uh, 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 material that goes into the chips, right. recycled material that goes into the casing. We are also making our factories more efficient. So zero waste factories is our goal. Uh, last but not the least, it's a very important part for us to also work as what we call renew supply chain, which means we can take devices back, renew them, and put them back into the market, which is, the, because there are a lot more people in this world today who need computational devices than those who actually have computational devices. So to, for us to work on making our products more sustainable and also our supply chains more sustainable, making renewed products back into the market, I think that's our framework and we are very committed to that. And does AI have a role to play in, in doing that? It does. Making your operations more efficient or trying it does. to find uh, you know, energy savings throughout your operations? Absolutely, I mean if you look at today, um, you know, we are talking about lights out factories those factories will run because they are you know, enabled through AI. We are talking about devices that will be optimized, whether it is you know, uh, eliminating the processes that are unnecessary and thereby increasing the, the battery life. It's all being driven by AI. So it, it has a lot of use. Now, we are at a very- I see ST nodding. Is it the same for Qualcomm? Yes. <laughs> yes. You're the same thing, sir? Well, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the chipset we just introduced and because of our heritage in in the very efficient computing and very, very efficient power consumption, you are going to be able to do more things in shorter period of time. And imagine that you, you can use these AI models after you really allow the thousands and thousands of developers to think about how to solve some of the problems you have just posed. You know, so I think AI with the right tools, with the right liberalization and uh, you know, uh, open up of, the, uh, of uh, the tools will enable a lot of solution to solve the problem, some, some of them that you just mentioned. That's, that's fascinating. Well, and while we have Dahi here, I want to ask, I, it's slightly off topic, but one of the amazing things about um, mini CPM and some of the models you've worked on is their ability to, to um, I guess, translate these ancient uh, Chinese calligraphy, these, these Singhua bamboo strips. I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that, because that was also one of these tests for the model. And I think it's also one of the ways they caught that, as you said, the Stanford uh, plagiarism case. <laughs> their model turned out could do this too, which was very strange if it hadn't been using your uh, training. But. Yeah, the, the, Qing, the Qinghua uh, bamboo split uh, is just uh, a Chinese ancient uh, re replics uh, that uh, uh, Qinghua economy, uh, a, a Qinghua friend uh, just uh, uh, sent to Qinghua. Uh, so uh, there is no uh, digital information on the internet we just uh, take a photogram and uh, use it as the uh, fine-tuned um, picture uh, to build it into our model. So uh, we very make sure that, that uh, any other model should have not the ability to uh, right. identify yeah. the, the, Qinghua, the text character on the Qinghua bamboo spirit. So that's the, the reason we uh, quickly uh, identify the model as the same. Right. Excellent. Well, we're out of time, but I want to thank uh, ST and Dahi and Vinay for being here. It's great to have you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.